Alright, here we are. Look, it's time for the show. Thanks for stopping by, everyone. I got into that music a little bit. Uh, welcome. This is John Park's workshop right here. We're in it, and we are in it. So thanks for stopping by over in our chats. We've got our YouTube chat up and running as well as our Discord. It looks like that right there. If you want to join in on this action, look how much Lots and lots of action there. You can head on over to adafru.it slash discord. That's our URL shortener. You'll get an instant invite. You'll click buttons. Discord will pop up or a website. It's always confusing to me. Uh, but somehow through all of that, you will end up a member uh, just for asking. You will become a member of this discord. Uh, and you can head over to the live broadcast chat channel to hang out with the people right here that you see. Uh, there's Andy Calloway. There's Johnny Bergdahl. Hello, DJ Devin 3, Paul Cutler, Noe. Hey, it's Noe Ruiz. Thanks for stopping by, Noe. Uh, Andy Calloway is in the house as well as C. Grover. So thanks, everyone, and uh, anyone whose name I missed. Thank you, too. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. So what have we got today? Uh, I've got some fun stuff. We've got uh, a little couple of cool upgrades and updates on our uh, computer perfection synthesizer project. Uh, hey, Beata Graf of Dalhagen and Dale Etchels over in our YouTube. Thanks for stopping by. Uh, what else? I've got a coupon code for you. If you want to save some money in the Adafruit store buying some stuff, I've got a 10% off coupon I'll share with you in a bit. Um, what else? I've got a recap of my product pick of the week. I've got a circuit Python Parsec that I think is a, a really helpful and useful one that I'd like to share. Uh, I've got a bit of a retro tech thing, a little throwback thing I wanted to show and tell. Uh, what else? I have a... Is that it? I feel like there's one other thing that I'm missing, but um, I guess we'll find out when we get there. So... Jay Castaneda asks, who doesn't like coupons? I don't know who doesn't like coupons. There's today's. Look, that drop shadow looks really neat on my shirt. Uh, it's just floating out in front of me. It's tinted. Tinted is your coupon code today. So if you want to get 10% off in the Adafruit store, just uh, type that in, in the uh, checkout line there. The online store has all kinds of great stuff thousands of products, in fact. Uh, I'm going to open up my, where'd my browser window go? Let me, let me add a tab to that. Whoops, not that one. Stand by. Here we go. Uh, this, this right here. Er, 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 er. That's the Adafruit store. Just go to afruit.com and you're in the store. Um, hello, Richard Doss. Nice to see you. Thanks for stopping by in the chat. Uh, and let us know if you have any thoughts, questions, things like that. I check the chat. Uh, I try to check it as much as possible, especially let me know if my audio drops off or something weird like that. Uh, but back to the, the topic at hand. Here's some new products right here. We've got this little 
uh, mini I square C gamepad with Seesaw that gives you a bunch of IO for adding some gamepad like functions to a project. I'm going to do something with that, I'm sure. Uh, we have a revision of one of our TFTs, this 240 by 135, 1.14 inch display. There's some new keycaps in the house for chalks. These, these are the, the little chalk key switches right here. Pull it off of the breakout. Uh, you can see there, that's actually one that went out of stock, but these look really cool. These white ones that you see there, uh, they have, I think, the same glow through material underneath. They're painted over, so they're not gonna glow. But I've discovered, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do some more research on this, I've discovered you can scratch off a little bit of that paint uh, or maybe even acetone it off or laser etch it, uh, mill it off, all depends on what tools you want to use, and get some nice glow through. Uh, so those are just some of the new products. If you, if you want, click on Products, View All next to New Products, and you'll see all the new products listed here. And there's lots, lots more. Uh, if you want to save some money, ju just go ahead and throw some stuff in your cart. And on the way out, type in that coupon code that's mysteriously floating right there. It's not really a mystery, is it? Uh, tinted. That's going to get you 10% off today. Uh, let's see. Other stuff. I have this show on Tuesdays. Speaking of products, I have that product pick of the week show. It happens right at this time, but on Tuesdays. It's at 1 o'clock Pacific, 4 o'clock Eastern time. Uh, and on that show, I like to show you a new product, or sometimes an oldie but goodie, give you a little bit of a demo, some hands-on stuff, show you some code, show you a little, little uh, project build I've done with it. It's one of my favorite things, by the way, each week, is to uh, get to play with some new products and come up with a demonstration of it solder together some stuff or breadboard some stuff together, write a little bit of code. Uh, it's a lot of fun and keeps me on my toes. Uh, here was this week's. So I'll give you a little one minute recap of this one. It was in fact those little breakout boards for the chalk key switches. Uh, take it away, me. The chalk Neo key breakout with socket built in. This is a tiny little PCB that you can use to add a chalk key switch. There is a NeoPixel underneath that shines up and through it. I'm ready to wire that up for cathode and anode for the switch, so you can use that in either pull up or pull down configurations. Those have a diode, so you can make a diode matrix if you want using our keypad library in CircuitPython. Power and ground for the NeoPixel, as well as the in and then on the bottom of the board, the out, so you can wire up a, a chain of NeoPixels with these. But I've quickly breadboarded and prototyped something here where I have NeoPixels, so you can see I've got color changing happening when I press the switches. Uh, and these are going through Cutie Pie to act as gamepad buttons essentially on my Steam Deck over here. It is the Neo Key Chalk Socketed Breakout. That's right, that was that. That was uh, the product pick of the week. So I'll be doing another one this coming Tuesday. So, so be sure to tune back in for that. Uh, I kind of buried the lead because not only do I show you a new product, you usually get around 50% off discount on up to 10 of them. Uh, if it's an Adafruit product, we have uh, the ability to drop down to 50% for that show usually. Uh, for some other stuff, third-party stuff, we don't have the kind of margins for that usually. But on Adafruit products, half off just during the show. There's no coupon code. Uh, you just simply buy it during the show and it is half price is listed at that uh, half off price right there in the product page. Uh, hey, Blitz City DIY. We've got some more people joining us over in the chat. There's Liz, hello Liz. Uh, did everyone see the cool synthesizer Liz is working on? She showed it on Show and Tell last night. That thing looks amazing. It uses, I think, five of the a and rotary encoders, the click wheels. So uh, even if it had no synthesizer in it, it would just be a really cool fidget toy to spin and, and click those wheels, but it does way more than that. Uh, so thanks for showing that last night, Liz. We're excited to see that project come to fruition and a learn guide will come out of it, I'm sure. Uh, who was thinking of croutons? Oh, yeah, we like coupons and I like croutons. How'd you know that? Okay, uh, let's... Now, uh, dive into a CircuitPython tip for you. Here's the CircuitPython Parsec. Yes, CircuitPython. Yes, 
Okay, let me uh, just change windows here. I'm going to add a window in a second, so remind me if I don't. Um, here we go. What I wanted to talk about today in the CircuitPython Parsec is how to download the latest build of CircuitPython up to the minute build using our Amazon S3 uh, site. So why do you want to do this, first of all? If you take a look at uh, this, Synth.io. Synth.io has been getting a lot of work. Jepler has been doing a lot of work on it. So he's updating it and he's uh, getting a, a merge of it into CircuitPython pretty frequently. But that takes a while to find its way into the big releases that you find here on the downloads page of CircuitPython.org. So if I go to this downloads page and I do Feather RP2040, I'm going to find the 8.1.0 and even a 8.2.0 beta 0. But if I look back at uh, this one from Jepler, this is newer than those. So what I can do is scroll down a little further to this absolute newest section. And it says I can click on this to browse S3. That's our Amazon S3 storage. Uh, and this might look a little bit uh, weird to people who aren't used to old-fashioned internet. So uh, this is a directory structure. And if I go to the language I want to use, I'm going to use English US, this E-N-U-S. I'll click on that. And now I get a list of all of these latest releases. Oh, in fact, this, this beta is new enough that I could have gotten it from there. But until... Uh, maybe an hour ago, the one right below it, that was the newest one. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and grab that one, let's say. I'm not grabbing the beta, but I'll grab one of those, any of those, grab a UF2 file, uh, and then I can go to my finder and grab from the downloads folder. You'll see right here, here's the UF2. Uh, I can go ahead and put this into uh, boot select mode. I missed the button, tiny button. And that's going to show up now as the uh, boot drive, the RPI RP2. Now I can drag and drop that UF2 that I downloaded onto there. It'll take a minute to copy over, and then when it restarts, it'll be running CircuitPython, and it'll be running the version I want. Uh, <clears throat> you can go to the release notes of the different CircuitPythons to find out which features and which PRs have been merged into them. Uh, but this is a really great way to grab uh, up to the minute, or pretty close to it, merges of CircuitPython to get the latest features. And one of the reasons I'm doing this is things like the LFO and other SynthIO features that I want just aren't in those big uh, releases that take a little, little while to, to get out there. So if you want to grab, grab that really new stuff, head to the download page and then find this link right here, browse S3, and that'll take you right to uh, the language page to grab the CircuitPython build that you want. And that is your CircuitPython Parsec. Excuse me. Uh, by the way, there was a link from DJ Devin 3 here that you can check out over in the Discord. And this is the uh, absolute latest nightly builds, which is a, a page he says is worth bookmarking there. And you can see that's at uh, Amazon AWS. Uh, and that's our, our latest builds right here. Uh, you can, from this page, find any of the boards, any of the hundreds of boards that run CircuitPython. You'll find the builds there. So... I went through the main page of the download section of circuitpython.org and I knew which board I wanted to find there, but you can just scroll through here and grab what you need. Let's say you're uh, putting this on a Cutie Pie ESP32 S2. Just click there, click on the language you want, and there you'll find your... Oh, I'm not showing you the page. Sorry, sorry. There we go. Uh, this is all of the different boards here that have that nightly build. And then you can go and find a board such as this Cutie Pie, go to the language you want, and then uh, grab the, the latest. Well, that's good. I learned something here that the beta is now, uh, should now have all that SynthIO stuff I want, I think. Uh, and you can go to the release notes for that, uh, for that build uh, in GitHub to find out more about it.
All right. Uh, so let's see. Uh, Katrina LaFay says, sitting on Facebook Live and no one answering. Yeah, so uh, we don't or I don't have enough uh, windows open and, and attention to, to look at every chat that we have. So uh, good places to, to go are the YouTube chat or our Discord. You go to adafru.it slash Discord. That's this uh, window I had up here. Look for that live broadcast chat channel. Uh, people hang out here all the time anyway. There's a lot of great channels if you want to go and get help on a particular uh, type of project, uh, if you want to participate in development of CircuitPython, uh, if you want to share pictures of your pets, a whole bunch of places there that you can, uh, you can go and, uh, and hang out. And that is where you'll find the chat in this live broadcast chat channel for uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, Live, uh, Periscope, if that's still around, Twitch, and a few others. All right. So... Uh, next up, I wanted to do a little bit of a retro tech, um, segment because I was cleaning out some boxes and bumped into a pretty neat artifact from the past, from about 2016, so about 13 years ago or so. Uh, let me give you a look at this right here, and I'll just adjust that focus a little bit. There we go. Uh, so this is something called the Make Controller. Uh, this is a microcontroller development board that was made by this company called Making Things, who I don't think are around anymore. Uh, and this was in collaboration with Make Magazine. Make Magazine was early in identifying that there were these uh, hobbyist uh, desires to make things that involved microcontrollers uh, and a microcontroller board that was approachable and had a lot of um, easy to connect features would be useful for makers. You can see here this is based on uh, a SAM 7 in Atmel. Uh, this one's the 1891 SAM 7 X256 uh, ARM processor. And on its own, uh, you can see it's got a bazillion breakouts there, uh, a lot of pins broken out. But what do you connect them to? So uh, before I show you that, actually, I'll, I'll, I'll show you an old blog post from Make Magazine with someone you may know, uh, our very good friend, Phil Tyrone, uh, who was the editor, online editor for Make Magazine. Uh, and let me see if it'll let me close some of these. Sure, I'll let your cookies in uh, so I can scroll the host. So this was a blog post from May 11th, 2006. Uh, and this talks about Make Magazine approaching making things to create the Make controller. Uh, and then they were offering it in the, the Make store as well as at Maker Fairs. Uh, and this thing right here that you see below, that's really what caught my eye. I saw this at a Maker Fair and, and picked it up there. I think where I got it. So if you take a look... Uh, right here. This is the application board. So this thing has everything on it. Look at how many different types of connectors this thing has. Um, refocus a little bit there. Okay. So you can see here, these are the headers where the make controller itself plonked in. I'll leave that off. Uh, but once that was in there, you now had broken out something like uh, four motor controllers, four servo controllers, uh, an Ethernet interface. Uh, here was USB, I think, for power and maybe data, I think, for programming it. Uh, and on and on, there were a lot of GPIO inputs for this thing. I can't remember if it had, I think it had analog inputs. Uh, here is a, I don't know what this IDC connector is for. Uh, if you do a little bit of searching around on Google... Uh, you will find this uh, site was archived by archive.org. Uh, it's not available anymore, but this was the makingthings.com uh, product page for the Make Controller Kit. You can see it wasn't cheap. Uh, it was $149, but that was both the, the microcontroller and the, the big um, application board, big breakout board. Uh, here's some of the features. This thing had eight analog inputs with 10-bit 10 10 uh, resolution, uh, eight high current digital outputs. So you could drive 
a bunch of motors right off of this thing, uh, steppers, DC motors. There were four servo controllers. Uh, there was a pretty neat feature on this, which is this dip switch uh, row down here. Idea uh, behind this was that you could code functionality into this thing that a user who wasn't going to go and change the actual code running on it could configure different settings uh, from this little dip switch set, which is really cool. One of the applications on it uh, that you could put on pretty easily, or maybe it shipped with it, uh, allowed you to configure the relationship between some of those pins and some of those motor drivers. So without someone knowing how to code, they could uh, change which input pins would drive which motors and how. Uh, it had a JTAG, JTAG port, it had a CAN interface uh, for networking these things. And then you can see from the uh, section on the right there, it was configured to run with a bunch of, again, giving the user control over some software that they would be more familiar with, Max MSP, Flash, uh, processing, and then .NET, C Sharp, C, C++, Python, Java. Uh, and you could uh, interface with it using OSC, which is sort of a modern day attempt at uh, uh, updating the MIDI protocol. It's, it's actually a, an entirely different protocol, but it's trying to do similar things that MIDI does. Uh, very powerful. Um, this was, I think, intended to be programmed in C using an ARM or an Atmel uh, environment of some kind. I never coded for it. I think maybe I tried something once and the tool chain was a bear. And this was coming out right pretty much when Arduino was coming out. So you, I think we all know who, uh, who won that battle. But uh, this is a really cool board. Actually, I'm noticing in the, in the uh, chat... Oh, no, no. Okay. Yeah, sorry. I got distracted by the chat, which is not talking about this board. Uh, anyway, that is my little uh, flash from the past here of this funky little make controller board. Uh, the projects that were done with it and are still um, documented out there are pretty minimal, but one of them that was, I think, pretty inspirational to a lot of makers was this one here. Uh, from Instructables, and this was um, how to make a uh, animatronic shoulder-mounted um, helmet. It was for a for a Stargate um, cosplay, and I believe this showed using one of the stock uh, pieces of code that was on there and a particular configuration of dip switches to enable all of the the motions that he wanted. Um, so kind of a, kind of a cool uh, project there on its own. And this was one of the few that, uh, that I remember seeing any um, uh, projects done for the Make controller that were, that were out there in sort of usual maker circles. So that is my little retro tech segment. Um, and if you have ever used this thing or seen it before, let us know in the chat. Uh, yeah, Toddbot says, before Arduino really. Uh, yeah, if you look in the comments on that blog post that Phil did, uh, someone says, yeah, this thing's kind of hard to use. You might want to check out this other thing called Arduino, uh, which is great. Let's see, who said that? Uh, yeah, Steve Cooley here says, if you want to get your feet wet with microprocessors, you could go grab an Arduino board. Lists a couple places to get them, Arduino CC and uh, SparkFun. And... Uh, yeah, this was, this was the dawn of this microcontroller era. So uh, I think that is it. All right. So let's see. Uh, next up, uh, there is uh, a little bit of a demo I want to do to talk about one of the SynthIO features that's new and, and that I've uh, started implementing in the... Uh, computer perfection synth. But before I do that, I actually wanted to talk about this update that I did just for lighting. So I'm going to grab grab the uh, computer perfection here. For those who don't know, this was a toy from around, what, 1981 or something? I can't remember exactly. Uh, designed by Ralph Baer. It was a sort of puzzle game, uh, memory kind of logic puzzle game. Uh, and I've been updating it to put a synthesizer inside of it, and I'm reusing all of these buttons and, uh, and switches and things. 
But one of their features in the original was there was one LED, a five millimeter red LED underneath each of these shapes. And due to the design of the circuit board, uh, it was going to be really difficult to use those just because they essentially share the same lines as the inputs and the, the microcontroller, um, which I have. Oh, it's no, it's not here. Uh, the little microcontroller, 4 bit microcontroller that I pulled out of that board uh, essentially toggled its pins between an input uh, and an output state really quickly. I don't want to deal with that at all, so what I decided to do was insert some NeoPixels into here. Now, one of the cool things about this is the red plastic, I'm going to change my cameras around here a second, the red plastic tinting, uh, which by the way is where we get our 10% our off coupon code from today, uh, the red plastic tinting means we get a really beautiful look. We also are not going to see any colors other than red coming out of this thing. So uh, let me do a little focus and a little uh, exposure and then I'll share this camera. Okay, so check this out. Uh, there's the computer perfection. So I've got a USB cable. There's a Metro M7 in here. I've got a speaker in there. I've got uh, an amplifier doing a bunch of synthy stuff, but when I turn it on now, you should see uh, a nice little startup sequence here of some LEDs starting up. Uh, and those are actually pretty close to where the originals were. The originals were just mounted underneath uh, the circles, but I, I found a really nice thin strip of NeoPixels I could wrap inside of here. Um, and it's dense enough that I can do things like that. I have a single LED uh, with two surrounding it that I don't light all the time. So if I start lighting a bunch of these, make a bit of a racket, uh, you'll see that I'm, I'm able to do like a little LED pulse kind of thing, uh, which is pretty neat. So um, I wanted to pull this apart for you now that you've seen it run. And uh, I'll show you how I've got those LEDs mounted in there. They're actually, um, they're not even mounted. They just kind of fit perfectly, but I may, uh, I may use a little bit of adhesive uh, to, to keep them secured for sure. Um, part of what I had to do was mapping which LEDs were positioned where uh, in my code. And let's see, can I switch to, yeah, let me pull that camera out of there. There, okay. Uh, so, so the uh, mapping of LEDs to the positioning on here uh, would change if I if I adjust the the ring here. So I want to be try try to be a little bit careful uh, to keep that position. And I just want to lower this light because it is super super bright. Oh, that's as, that's as dim as it wants to go. Okay. Wow, that's bright. Okay, uh, so let's pull this apart again. One of one of the things that I'm really loving about this this toy, this game, is how accessible the guts are. You just pull these two screws out, and let me just tip this up. So here you can see. Hopefully, you can see it in there. This is the space right here. I'm going to zoom in real tight. And I'll try to focus on the NeoPixels. So this is the circuit board that I'm reusing all the buttons from, and I have my uh, ribbon cable connecting to my controller. Uh, right in this space is a little circle in there. And I'll go ahead and disconnect things so you can see that. So I've got my USB cable. Uh, I think I can maybe disconnect my amplifier there. Uh, so you can see these are three additional wires that are on my uh, little screw shield here that are my NeoPixel line. So this is a uh, the, the strip, I'll show you in a second, comes with three wires on it. Uh, 
So ground, power, and a data line. I'm running these off a of three volt and that's working fine. Uh, it also keeps the, the power the same as the logic. And now if I pull this board out of here, oh, magnetic screwdriver. Uh, since I've unscrewed and rescrewed these screws multiple times, I'm trying to be very careful not to uh, strip the plastic holes. The, the, the plastic is sort of tapped probably by the original uh, insertion of the screws during manufacture. Uh, so I'm always trying to be really careful when I put these in that I catch that threading and I'm not uh, widening those holes. It's a little tricky to get at with my microcontroller there. Okay, so I'll leave this, uh, try to leave this upside down. So you can see, oh, it's gonna come out. Okay, I'll get to reinsert that. There we go. Uh, so there's this little uh, sort of overkill. The length of it is about two and a half times what I need in there. Uh, but this is this nice little LED strip that just happened to fit in a space, uh, a really neat space right here. I'm able to run wires out along the same, same places that the uh, speaker wire of the original toy ran out of. Uh, and those little teeny, I think these are the four millimeter uh, NeoPixel strip, these work really well uh, for this use. So I'm gonna put that back in there. I'll have to align that a little better. I think later, but I'm gonna put this back together so we can take, take a listen in a little bit to uh, the demo of the LFO feature that I'm starting to work with. Uh, so let me know if you have any questions about the NeoPixel stuff and I'll show you, uh, if someone wants to find it and put a, put a link in the chat, uh, that would be great, but I'll, I'll come over there in a minute and uh, show you that strip. It does have an adhesive on the back side, which isn't useful for the arrangement that I'm using, but depending on, depending on your needs, that might be a good way to uh, affix that to your project. You know what, I'll leave those two screws out. That's fine for the demo we're gonna do. And now I just wanna reconnect my amp. and we'll reconnect USB in here. I may in the final project do a little USB breakout so you can plug in a, any cable you want down at the bottom of the device. Uh, but for now, I just ran it out of the battery hole in the bottom. Okay. There's that and I will put these uh, two screws in here, otherwise the whole uh, gizmo will fly open when I press any of the upper buttons. There we go. Okay, so we will come back to that uh, to take a listen to it. But uh, that, is, that is how I've added uh, LEDs to it. And then in the meantime, first of all, I just wanna adjust a light over here that's right in my face and usually lives a little higher. There we go. Uh, so next thing I wanna do is uh, give you uh, another demo, I've done some, uh, some other demos. I did one uh, with a little keyboard a couple weeks ago, but I just wanna give you a demo of uh, a low frequency oscillator being used as a modulation source. Uh, so I've got a small Eurorack uh, case here with two modules in it. I'm gonna unpatch it. Uh, and I will go ahead and turn this on and I'll pick a, uh, a synth voice here. Uh, the two modules are 
a sound source, a voice, sometimes that's called, this one on the left here, this is um, uh, a macro oscillator, which means it's a, it's a digital oscillator that can be a lot of different synth uh, algorithms and synth types. Um, I'm going to use probably just this is a mix between a triangle and a, and a square or a PWM wave. Uh, so with that, uh, this thing will just make noise on its own. If I plug this in, it's just going to start making noise. Actually, i got to check one thing. That it uh, will actually make noise and not, there, not require me to ping it. Okay, so this should just make noise if I plug it in. Um, sound, maybe music even, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to oscillate at an audible frequency. We're going to hear it making some sound, synthesized sound. This module on the right I'm using as a low frequency oscillator. So they're actually very, very similar things, uh, but where this is going anywhere from 20 to 20,000 hertz, you know, audible range stuff, depending on your age and the state of your ears. Uh, this is slow stuff. This can go anywhere from, I think, like a two minute or maybe a 20 minute sine, uh, you know, peak to peak uh, wave up to, actually this one can go to audible rates, but we're going to keep it slow because what we want to do is have it be a virtual knob turner for us. Um, so a low frequency oscillator, that's the thing that's been added to SynthIO that I want to talk about. Uh, the way I want to use it is as a modulator, which means it can just wiggle a knob for me automatically at a fixed rate. Uh, so let me demonstrate that. I'm going to take a little speaker here. I will check in to see that you can hear it uh, once I get this set up. And I'll, I'll plug it in and we'll listen to it briefly and then we might pl unplug it because it'll get annoying uh, while I talk about the LFO setup, low frequency oscillator setup. Okay, so this is uh, our synth voice. And you can see I can change this character of is it mostly that triangle wave? Or is it mostly that square wave? Uh, this is a similar type of uh, related control here. We can also change things like the pitch, but I'm gonna, I'll probably just leave that where it is, but you can see here. All right, we've got pitch, I uh, have it quantized to hitting semitones. Okay, so that's the, that's the uh, synth voice, the, the oscillator that's at audible frequency. Uh, and then this thing over here, you can see this um, sort of slowly pulsing uh, LED here. Let me check my focus. That's a little better. Uh, this is the rate that this thing is oscillating. So it's got this second or so uh, rate that it is a, a voltage is coming out of this thing from uh, these outputs here. I can use that voltage to control one of the knobs over here. So I'm going to take, uh, let's, let's listen to it again. And now I'm going to take, uh, how about, actually, before I do it, let's look at it. So I brought some, some patch cables that will let me output uh, to a little oscilloscope so we can see the thing and then still pass that same voltage over to the oscillator. So uh, let's plug that in there. Let's turn this on. And I might try for a second here to adjust the, this little scope. Y offset. Just drop this down. Okay, that's not bad actually. We can kind of see the whole wave in there. Okay. Uh, so if I set that there, I can now pass that same signal. I'll, I'll just leave this here, but then I'm going to grab that same uh, wave that's coming out of there. Let's use a longer cable. So I'm just stacking those on top of each other right there. Uh, and now I'm going to take that and I'm going to plug that into uh, the timbre. So let's listen to it without. And then I'll plug that into the timbre. 
So you can see it's wiggling that knob back and forth for me. If I slow it down. And, oh yeah, and tell, tell me if you can hear that. Uh, one second. Um, and I can keep an eye on the chat over there, but I think, let me know if you need that to be louder. And I'm going to raise the pitch. That'll make it a little easier to hear, too. Okay, leave it alone. Now I'm going to plug it into this other uh, knob, the, cha the color. Now, in this case, I don't need the negative uh, half of that wave, so I'm going to use a unipolar, so I'm just getting the positive voltage down to zero, positive voltage down to zero. And again, I can change this rate. Now we can also change the shape of this. So I have a, essentially a sine wave here, but we can uh, change the um, shape of it into something more like a triangle, taking that sine and turning it into something like a triangle. Um, we can also just sort of change the slew or the, um, uh, the shape of the curve. So here we go. So this is gonna go more triangular. Uh, we can go and sort of slew this one way or another, or change the slope. Go the opposite way. And one interesting thing about this, uh, this LFO as a modulator is it actually doesn't even need to be a continuous curve. We can do something with a stepped output, which is almost like pressing two different uh, voltages or values. So if I switch this to be uh, a high value, you can see I just have this little um, square wave. So now we're not interpolating between those values. Uh, this is actually something you can't really do with the knob yourself because you always have to work your way from one point to another. This just jumps automatically directly between and it can be used for pitch things as well or timbre All right, I think that's enough of that. Uh, so let me just check, I'm gonna check the Discord actually from right here to see if you have any questions. Um, let's see, da, da, da. Mm, here we are, live broadcast chat. Uh, Okay, one question was DJ Devin 3 asked, are there basic examples for SynthIO? Those are in the works. There are some gists out there, uh, but there will be a guide for sure. And I think Todd Bot may do a, a, a little SynthIO cookbook. I'm hoping he will, because uh, he's been writing great examples. Uh, Tyeth asks, are there any knobs that wiggle for real as a result of inputs like the motorized slide potentiometer? Yeah, in fact, there, there's a synthesizer that came out kind of just in the last six months or so, uh, and I can't remember 
the manufacturer, but there's a, there's a synth that has motorized knobs, all of them, which means when you pick presets, all the knobs go to exactly where the preset had them. It's incredible. I think it's incredibly expensive just because of the number of, of parts and uh, motor drivers in there. Um, so yeah, just like motorized faders, there are motorized uh, potentiometers. Uh, okay, so that is the basics of an LFO. Now, what's happening in SynthIO is that Jeff created a, um, uh, a way to create an, an LFO inside of SynthIO. So in SynthIO, you can make an LFO. You can tell it what wave shape to use, just like I showed. We can do um, something like a triangle here. We can uh, do kind of a, a wacky wave. We can use sort of wavetable types of synths. We could use pure noise, which would be a little wacky. Um, but we get to pick the shape of that LFO. We also get to pick the range of it. So um, that's something, actually, I don't have a, a way to show you it on here easily, but uh, I was using one of these knobs as an attenuator to say, you know what, even though this is outputting, I think, negative 5 to positive 5 volts or something like that, uh, I want to squish that range down. So we can do that in SynthIO. We can say, okay, the, the bottom and the top of my um, my low frequency oscillator is going to be X and Y. Uh, so as you set that, it, it will um, attenuate the impact of it. So with something like this, right, we're going about a note or so, about a semitone. Um, if I change the amount of attenuation, I can say that same curve is being used for even more uh, of a change down to nothing, almost nothing. That's not perfect. Um, so we can set the rate of the LFO and then we can attach it to something. So just like I use this patch cable right here to say I'm going to output this low frequency oscillation and I'm going to point it into the pitch or the uh, frequency modulation, the timbre, the color, we can do that inside of SynthIO. So we can say, okay, I want the pitch to be wiggling up and down. Uh, I want the uh, mix between waveforms, which is sort of like what these things are doing here. When I change the timbre, I'm going between a couple of different wave shapes. Okay, so you can see we're kind of shifting between two different types of, uh, of tones there or, or harmonics that we get from the shape of the actual audible oscillator uh, with just the same old LFO. We create that LFO and then we say, what's it going to plug into? Uh, so let me demonstrate for you uh, that now on my computer perfection over here because thanks to that implementation and some code examples from Todd, so implementation by Jepler, uh, and I think Mark Gambler is now contributing to some of that code, um, we can take a SynthIO object running in CircuitPython, and this is on my uh, Metro M7, and we can um, assign, create an LFO, assign it to some parameter, and ch even change its uh, frequency or the rate of that oscillation. Uh, so I'll plug this in, see my little lights light up. Uh, and what I've got going on right now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna play a note and, or maybe two notes, and I've got it set to hold mode, so these will just hold. Uh, and now I've reassigned this button. I had been using it for something else last week, a sustain release, I don't want it for that anymore, I wanted it for changing the rate of the LFO. Uh, so what we'll get to do is we'll hear the uh, waveform changing, just like that last example. The waveform, the, the type of character of the sound, color of the sound, will be changing at a certain rate. Uh, I can tap this little set button to increase it and increase and increase it as much as I can. I can long hold it to decrease, long hold it to decrease. So that's, that's how I'm using this, uh, this one button, uh, a long press decreases the rate, a short press increases the rate. So here we go, here's some sounds.
Right, so that, that low frequency oscillator is wiggling that fast and it is shifting between two types of waveform. Gets a little weird at the top end of its, of its rate. Not sure why yet. Now long hold it and I'll slow it down. So now it's slow, we get this nice build. Can change the waveforms that it's using. Speed that up again. Now it's a much faster LFO. Just kind of changing the character of that sound. Almost filter-like, just because of the two waveforms that I'm going between. Some funny behavior at the top of its speed. Let's slow it back down. And then I'll release all those at once. And that'll work on uh, notes that I'm just playing or held notes. So I can, I'm gonna speed that back up just so it's obvious. You can see my LEDs are all screwed up, by the way. Remember I said if I unplug them, I'll get them out of order. They're definitely out of order, so. I can improve that. Get a faster LFO. Uh, this button still gives me a bass octave. Sounds nice. That gives me kind of triplets, the uh, LFO at that top of its range, which is fun, but I don't know why it's doing it. Uh, hopefully you can hear that. That was just coming out of this little speaker right here and the uh, I2S amplifier that I have that you saw me plugging in earlier. So it's not going through my little Bluetooth thing or, or any other amplification. That's just that, that nice little uh, enclosed speaker. It sounds pretty good. Uh, let's see. Good. Okay, so I think that that covers the demo I wanted to show. Let me uh, go ahead and bring this over to the uh, computer here and I can show you the code that I've got running on there. Let's switch over here for a moment. Hello. All right, I'm gonna plug this in. And give you the light show. Pretty good there. Sorry about that glare. That's a little better. Uh, let's actually go to this view here. Mm, yeah, that one. And I'm just going to make my circuit Python window a bit bigger. Hold on one second. reshape this. Okay. Here we go. Uh, so I'm going to open, let's see, is that the right code? Nope. That's from a different microcontroller. Let me unplug. <laughs> is that one? No, I unplugged that, right? No, I didn't. Okay. Dangerous having two CircuitPython devices plugged in at the same time on your computer get very confused. Okay, yes, this is it. So this has not been optimized. There may be a bunch of mess in here, but the key things that I want to show you are 
I'm importing synth.io. That kind of takes care of everything I need for the synth stuff. Uh, also, Jeff, sorry if you're watching. I am not using frequencies yet. I'm kind of still using the MIDI notes, and I'm not sure if we want to be switching away from that. But uh, I have uh, a list of notes here that I've also uh, hor horrifyingly just made it do the math of I wanted to drop an octave. So that's my note list. That's the, I think it's a Lydian scale of what I'm playing on the 10 keys uh, plus a couple extra notes. Uh, so the key thing for this uh, example here, and I'm sorry, I'm going to have to, I think I'm going to, I'm going to scale down the text just a little bit so more of it fits. Hopefully you can still read that. Uh, so the key things that are going on here uh, that are new, I've got my synth that I'm setting up. I have four waveforms that are my audible waveforms that I'm using, and in one case I'm reusing that uh, waveform for my LFO. So I've got a sine wave, I've got a saw-shaped wave, which is the uh, slope with an instantaneous drop, looks like a sawtooth. I've got weird wave, which is more of a wavetable synth, just some, uh, some points in a table that have been set up. So that was something from one of Todd's examples. Uh, and then I've got a noise, and I can't remember, I think I'm mixing noise with one of those. Uh, the LFO, you can see, is created here. So I'm, I'm setting a value as a variable called um, LFO rate. And that is uh, initially set to 4, which is 4 hertz. Uh, and then I'm creating an LFO object by saying LFO1, you can zoom in a little more, LFO1 equals synthio.lfo, then I tell it a rate, which is my LFO rate variable from before, so 4 hertz, and then the shape of the LFO, in this case it's the sine wave. Uh, then I append this to the uh, LFO's objects of the synth itself. Uh, so I just have one, but you can use more than one. Uh, again, I think Todd had an example of using uh, a pair of them for cross-modulation of the um, uh, ring modulator, so it sounds bonkers and really cool. Uh, then in my main code, uh, let me find my mix. Where'd it go? Oh, before I go down to that, yeah, so you can see here, initially I set my waveform to be the saw, and a wave mix of zero, so that audible sound we're hearing is a saw wave. Uh, if we look way down at the bottom, uh, I have if wave set is zero, and that's what this mode switch switches here, then I'm going to do a linear interpolation between a sine wave and that weird wave, and instead of just telling it how much to mix between the two, which is what that knob that I was using, that, that timber, timbre knob or the color knob we're using, uh, tell it which mix I want between the two waves, I'm saying use whatever the value is of my LFO after I have um, attenuated the LFO uh, into the range that I want. So I'm taking a negative one to one, which is the, the sort of full values of the LFO, uh, peak to peak, and I'm actually changing that to be a 0 to 1, just because the mix parameter doesn't go negative, it just wants a 0 to 1. Uh, so we do this, this little linear interpolation uh, between those, and then while it's playing, it's going to run at initially 4 hertz, so that knob is just going back and forth at that 4 hertz rate. Uh, if you look at my mod buttons, this one right here, and sorry, pardon me for the code that's, that's commented out here. Uh, so mod buttons are these two, say modifier buttons. So the set button is button zero. Uh, if I press button zero, we are checking to see the current time versus the last time it was uh, pressed so that I can uh, calculate if it's a long press or a short press. Uh, I was trying to find a, a, a neater way to do that. I thought maybe in keypad we have that, but actually that's in, in the um, uh, debouncer code. There's like a long press that's just kind of built into it, but I had to um, do the 
do the logic here of checking the current time uh, versus the last time. If that mod button is released uh, and the uh, press was a short press, then my LFO rate becomes my LFO rate increased by 0.25. So I'm multiplying it by 1.25. And that's how I'm just kind of stepping up. I'm not doing a smooth thing here clearly, but I'm just stepping up some, some rates that seemed good to me. Uh, and then my LFO one dot rate becomes that number. If it is a long press right here, uh, then the LFO rate is going to be divided by a quarter. So LFO rate times 0 0.25. I'm not sure if I did that right. It seems to work, but if, if, uh, if you have suggestions, particularly Jepler, on a, on a better way to use one button to sort of cycle rates. Um, there, by the way, was a, a good point that DJ Devin3 made, which is since these uh, low frequency oscillators that are modulating between these two sort of characters of wave sounds are not in any particular time. Uh, they're not, there's, this is not a sequencer drum machine. I don't have a beat. Uh, I can play it at whatever rate I want. I actually will end up playing it at a rate that makes sense with that LFO. It's something I found if you have a modulator that's running at a constant uh, rate, you will then tend to you know, play a note and let it wobble four times and then play a different note. So you can, you can kind of build your, um, your tempo of playing around the LFOs. Uh, and also, uh, as DJ Devin3 was saying, if you have your uh, LFOs running quite slow, then it's really suited to ambient music. Um, this, in this case, is this sort of sci-fi pad. So. By the way, you'll see I can't press these upper buttons because I didn't screw in those other two screws, so they're, the PCB is a little <laughs> wiggly and far away. Um, so that is, uh, that is the LFO object. Uh, this is not, what I'm showing here is not a tutorial on uh, the right way to code it. Uh, it is just an example of how it's, it's sort of plugged into the system. We will write some proper uh, guides on SynthIO, and uh, I think Todd agreed that he'll be doing a, a SynthIO cookbook, uh, which will be great. Look forward to that. I'll be, I'll be uh, referencing it all the time, I'm sure. Um, and I'm just going to check the chat here to see if there's any uh, other questions that people have. Here, by the way, are some uh, different LFO um, graphs that Jepler did here. Um, for uh, ways that you can adjust that. So you can adjust the phase offset so it's not a uh, constant uh, phase. You can adjust uh, the scale of it. So that's like that attenuation thing I was talking about. Uh, the rate and the offset, which I think just pushes the, um, the thing up or down. So let's see. Uh, other stuff there. Uh, yeah, Todd has a good suggestion of just making a list uh, for my possible LFO rates and just cycle between them. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and hey, Jepler, you're here and, and yes, well, you're really welcome. Thank you for writing it. This is great. Uh, there's also a related uh, utility function that Jeff has created. I, I can't remember if that's in release yet or not. I don't think so. Uh, called a math block, and the math block is going to be something we can use to do things, uh, utility-like things, such as add together two waveforms, you know, add a couple of LFOs together uh, and use their output somewhere else. So if you're into modular synthesizers, look at the maths uh, Eurorack module from Make Noise uh, or uh, a, a Buchla, um I forget the name of the, the, the Buchla one that that's sort of based on dual slope generator, I think. Um, but these math types of functions uh, that can be LFOs, be uh, envelopes, are, are closely related to this uh, topic of having LFOs and, um, and math blocks. And in fact, these can kind of be used in some cases instead of or to augment um, 
our envelopes, our ADSR envelopes we were talking about. Uh, yeah, and math blocks are also in the latest version, so I gotta, I gotta uh, play with those. I haven't tested them out yet and, uh, and show you how, how I've implemented those. All right, I think, is that it? I think that's gonna cover it. Uh, I'll mention once again, if you want to go ahead and get yourself some good stuff, and of course it helps us keep the lights on here at Adafruit, uh, then buy some stuff, but get yourself a discount right there, tinted. Uh, we'll get you 10% off today in the store, so head over to adafruit.com, look at some new products, look at some favorite featured products, just search randomly. Um, we don't have a random function in the store, but you can just type in product ID numbers and see what you find. That's kind of a fun sport. Uh, let me bring up my, my Chrome again. If you go to Adafruit, uh, and if you pick on a, any product, you'll see, oh, it's just, it's just a number here. All right, let's see. Is there a product uh, 570? Why, yes, it is. It's a high-altitude balloon skill badge, iron-on bow. It's discontinued. Oh, that's, that's too bad. Let's see. What's, what's something near that number? Also discontinued. Ooh, we're in a discontinued range. Let's, let's try uh, 779. A green 3-millimeter. Those are tiny. Green 3-millimeter LED pack. 25 of them for $4.95. So... Yeah, we do have a uh, roll of the dice for the learn guides. I don't know if you've, you've seen this feature before, but if you're over in learn, you may have missed it, but there's a little pair of dice here. You can see me hovering over them. Uh, if you click that, you get a random learn guide. So that's kind of a fun, hey, here's, here's a, a cool ADC and DAC breakout. Uh, here's using NeoPixels with NetDuino plus two. I don't even know what that is. Uh, here's an airlift shield. So that's kind of a fun, fun game there. Uh, oh, look, there's one I did, a uh, snow globe with the Circuit Playground Blue Fruit. Uh, so yeah, we don't, have, we don't have dice on the store, but you can uh, more likely search for something you actually want. Uh, great uh, comment from C. Grover over in our chat that he's blown away by the progress on Synth.io. Uh, the, yeah, Jeff, come on. This has been fantastic. How, uh, how, how is this working in CircuitPython? Amazing. We have, we have a synthesizer. Uh, so thank you so much for all the work on that. I know Jeff is ready to uh, dive into some other meaty things. He's also got his cool CPM uh, running on a Pico. Uh, you should check out. It was in the uh, show and tell last night. Really cool. That's going to do it for me. Thanks, everyone. I am going to try to wrap this up. And uh, I've started taking pictures of the build for the Learn Guide. I think I'll just uh, solidify my NeoPixel strategy there um, and get that uh, put together. If you want to get one of these, just look for Computer Perfection on eBay. They usually go in the $40 range or so. Uh, you don't even need a working one, potentially, depending on what you want to do with it. But uh, just want to make sure your lid's not cracked. Look, at crack. Look, you can still see the LEDs in there. Uh, all right. Thanks, everyone. I'm going to take off now, and we'll see you next week. I think we've got a deep dive with Foamy Guy Tim tomorrow. Uh, we'll have a product pick of the week on Tuesday, Wednesday. You should have the return of 3D Hangouts, a show and tell, and then ask an engineer, and then I'll be back on this uh, next week. So thanks, everyone, for stopping by for Adafruit Industries. I'm John Park. This has been John Park's Workshop. Bye-bye. <laughs>